Was a man murdered by the police? Or by the dark entities that plagued him on his final day? And then we take a look at the interesting story known as the Bosack Encounter. Did a lonely farmer run into a UFO piloted by Bigfoot? Or is it even weirder than that? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jim. That's awfully official. Sound like I was trying out for a job on the radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day, too. So, you know, one thing I want to talk about real quick, I don't think it, it deserves its own full segment, but it's something I have to address. Again, it happened during the break. It was another thing that kind of happened during the break. YouTube says that they are going to, they're going to stop recommending conspiracy videos. Now, you may think, well, Jason, this video, you talk about conspiracy theories, but you, you kind of like poo-poo most of them. I still get caught up in that net. I'll do videos where I'm like, Sandy Hook was obviously, it obviously happened. It wasn't faked. I don't think it was an inside job or false flag or anything like that. Those videos get flagged by YouTube, even when I'm disputing it. And I don't put any of that in my uh, tags. I don't tag it like that. But when I upload the videos, they do an auto-caption. So basically, the computer algorithm reads my video. It's kind of interesting because it'll have the subtitles are probably about like 95% correct. And it picks up that I say, you know, Sandy Hook or whatever. Even though I'm saying that did happen, that it is not, that all of that stuff is conspiracy theory, it's not true. I still get flagged. And you can see videos, they'll have a disclaimer on them saying, this is what really happened during Sandy Hook. And I was like, yeah, that's what I said. You're, you're posting a disclaimer saying what I said. And I'm fine. It's YouTube's, it's YouTube's f- uh, place, whatever. Like, I get that they have those algorithms in place. So there, that decision may affect the YouTube side of the show. It's obviously not going to affect the podcast side. However, a lot of listeners have discovered the podcast through YouTube. We'll see how that plays out. Now, I was talking to Mitchum about it, and I said, you know, because he's like, yeah, it's the end of an era. I said, yeah, you know, that's where most people get their conspiracy theory information from is YouTube. They're still going to allow those videos. They're just not going to recommend them. So now when I type in, great, now this video is going to get get uh, put on there. But when I type in Adam Lanza or Sandy Hook or whatever, it's no longer going to recommend any conspiracy videos. It's only going to be official stuff. And that, from a business side, that makes sense. Again, I'm not faulting YouTube for that at all. Because now if you type in Adam Lanza or 9-11, most of the stuff you're going to get is going to be conspiracy theory. I don't know about right now, but definitely a week ago that was the case. So, but we are talking, and this is an interesting thing. At what point does something stop becoming a conspiracy theory? Obviously, if you type in 9-11, you type in Sandy Hook, you're going to get all the conspiracy videos. What if I type in, are vaccines healthy? And Mitchum goes, well, at what point, that was his question, at what point does it become a conspiracy theory versus just a weird medical practice? And vaccines is actually a good one to look at because that, people on both sides of the aisle... You have left wingers and right wingers who will not vaccinate their kids. It's one of the it's one of the few conspiracy theories that goes across both political across the political spectrum. Sandy Hook tends to be people. Oh, they're trying to grab our guns. That's why it's fake and stuff like that. That tends to be a more conservative conspiracy theory. And then Mitchum was like, "What about like at what point do we look at religions like Scientology and say, no, 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 we're not going to? If you put in, I'm feeling depressed." Or tips for depression, will a Scientology video pop up? Or is that a conspiracy theory? And those are interesting questions. And again, we're just kind of chatting on Messenger about this stuff. And YouTube has to deal with all that stuff now. And my thing is, if, and this is what I told him too, if Robert Mueller's report comes back saying Donald Trump did not collude with the Russians, does that mean if I ever type in Donald Trump Russians, is that all a conspiracy theory now? Because it was proven false? So it'll be an interesting thing to see how YouTube deals with this and how they define a conspiracy theory. I imagine they're just going to take the big ones first, 9-11, Sandy Hook, the Aurora shooting, you know, like the Boston bombing. I think they're going to take on those first, but eventually people will say, hey, why are you letting anti-vaxxers? Why did I type in this video about I want to know about the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine and everything that popped up was some weird conspiracy theory. They're really going to have to drill down on this if this is the path they want. Because they'll get taken to task for still recommending certain conspiracy theories. It's a slippery slope for them. 
But yeah, that was another bit of news that happened while I was on vacation. I'm actually not even going to upload that part to YouTube. Ha! Ah, joke's on you, giant conglomerate. You're not getting any ad money for my six-minute video. Ha <laughs> ha! See, I beat the filter. If you want to hear that juicy detail, you yeah, should listen to the podcast. Let's go ahead and get started with our first story. First story's kind of tragic, and you may go, Jason, that's quite insensitive. You're trying to turn this into something that it may not be. And I'm very aware of that. So I'm going to try to tread lightly in a sense. But I do think it's a very interesting story. And I think the way it's being reported is very interesting. January 2019. This happened probably right before my vacation started. There was a dude in Patterson, New Jersey named Jameek Lowry. Now Jameek Lowry calls up 911 and is like, I took a bunch of ecstasy. I'm totally freaking out. There are these shadow people on the walls. They're haunting me, man. They're haunting me. He ends up being taken to the hospital because he's just totally out of it. And they're they're trying to treat him for it. He's having basically an ecstasy overdose. And he's seeing these shadowy figures all around him. This is a true story, by the way. This isn't creepypasta. I guess I should have started off like that. And he gets freaked out. And he leaves the hospital. He leaves the hospital. They're going to kill me, man. They're going to kill me. And this is what I mean. It's interesting because when the news article, when he's saying they... They'll put in parentheses what they think he means. But anyway, so he leaves the hospital. A while later, he walks into a police station. And when he gets into the police station, this is a quote from the article. At one point, Lowry seems to be hallucinating, saying, I saw them by the wall. I see them. I see them. Yo, they're trying to kill me. An officer then shines his flashlight at the wall and calmly says, ain't nobody there. Lowry replies, he's right there. Walk over there. The police are trying to kill me. They think I'm a witness. They think I'm fucking with the FBI. He alternates between ranting, pleading for help, and admitting, I'm just paranoid. That's it. So, first he talks about these shadowy people on the wall. Cops are trying to reassure him there's nothing there. When he says the police are trying to kill me because they think I'm fucking with the FBI, it's his family after he... Spoiler alert. He doesn't live through the night. But after he passes away, his family says that there was an FBI investigation going on in the area and he got it in his head that he was somehow a suspect, even though he had nothing to do with what was going on. So I think he probably had some paranoid delusions before this happened. But so he goes to the police station and he pulls out his phone and he's videotaping himself. He's at, and that's why we have all these quotes. He goes to the police station and he's totally freaking out and he's talking about creatures on the wall And then he switched to the cops are going to kill me because the FBI and all this stuff. And the whole time he's asking for water. He goes, I'm so dehydrated, I just need water. Now, there's about five or six cops standing around him at this point because you have this totally erratic guy in your police station. And the cops are like, they say, I can't give you water. I can't give you any water. And people are like, why can't the cops give him water? And they're actually, it's protocol because they said, we don't know what he was on. And we don't know if water will make it worse. Because there are some toxins that you need to get out of your system. And if you put water in, it'll make it worse. So until he gets taken to the hospital, they don't know what he's on. Now what's interesting is that here he says, the police are trying to kill me. They think I'm a witness. Blah, blah, blah. Later on, he leaves another video or he says in a different point in the video, he says, if I'm dead by the next hour or two, they did it. I didn't touch them at all. And the article puts in that... They means the police. This is my theory. And again, maybe a little insensitive. But could they be the things that were on the wall? Was he really being plagued? Was doing the drug and having this psychotic breakdown and letting him see these creatures that had been stalking him and giving him paranoid delusions? And you think, Jason, that's quite insensitive and 100% not true. But here's where the mystery lies. The cops end up saying... You got to go to the hospital, dude. Like, you're totally freaking out. You need water. We can't give you water. We don't know what you took. Let's put you in the hospital. The cops call an ambulance. The ambulance shows up. The cops have to take him and they put him in the ambulance. And the ambulance people are like, okay, this guy's obviously on something. We're going to take him to the hospital. Everything is going to be fine. They get to the hospital. The dude is bashed up. It's a 5 to 12 minute ride to the hospital. By the time they get to the hospital, he's completely unconscious, placed in a life support, dies two days later. Broken cheekbone, 
fractured eye socket. Somebody kicked the crap out of him. The ambulance staff is like, whatever happened, it did not happen in our ambulance at all. Didn't happen. There was no, there weren't a bunch of cops back there beating him up. When the cops put him in, they did have to restrain him to put him in the ambulance, but the ambulance drivers were watching it. Now you could say maybe everyone's covering for each other, but the ambulance, the ambulance drivers really don't have any reason to cover for these cops. Because they're, the, the ambulance drivers are being held responsible. They're like, why did this guy get picked up? And then when he comes out, his face is bashed in. And the ambulance drivers are like, we don't know. Like, it makes them look suspicious. They could have been like, well, the cops were treating him a little rough, you know. Cops put him in the back of the ambulance. The ambulance drives to the hospital. The dude arrives completely unconscious, beat up. The cops are like, we put him in the ambulance. We had nothing to do with it. He dies two days later. The cops are on administrative leave. They're investigating the ambulance drivers. And nobody's pointing the finger at each other. They're both saying, we don't know. That's what makes the story weird. Now, it's possible that he gave... the it, it, Obviously, the most logical explanations are he was roughed up by the police and the ambulance drivers are covering for it. He was roughed up by the ambulance personnel and the police are covering for them. He inflicted the injuries himself in his psychotic delusion. Those are the more likely scenarios. But this is a paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. And when I read this article, I was like, that's kind of creepy. He's hallucinating these things. He thinks they're going to kill him. Then he thinks the cops are going to kill him. And then he thinks the FBI is going to kill him. And he dies. Was something else in that ambulance with that young man? Creepy. Creepy story. Okay, so for our next story, which is still, it's creepy on a different angle. Now, our next story is actually a recommendation because it is recommendation week. This is from an email from Bennett. He actually requested or recommended Quite a few Bigfoot stories. It's funny, one of them, he was like, have you ever heard about Vanishing Bigfoot? A couple of people have referenced that to me as well. And I was like, oh no, I'll look into it. There's like 300 sightings of Vanishing Big Feet. And I'm like, okay, it's going to take me a four. It's going to take me a while, but I'll get around to it. But this story is fairly simple. The implications are quite creepy. But it involves a lonely farmer, a dark, foggy night and a close encounter of the furred kind. It's winter, 1974, and we are in Polk County, Wisconsin, home of four touchdowns in a single game. There's a dude, he's 68 years old, named William Bosack. Now, generally, UFO sightings, when people are like, dude, I dropped like eight tabs of acid and saw God last night, I'm obviously going to dismiss that. But there is something with... People, like older people who see UFOs, you're like, you know, what what does that guy have to, like, that guy's probably not making that up. Most UFO sightings I actually don't think are made up. I don't think most ghost sightings are made up either. I think people are either mistaken or it's their imagination and some of them are real. But it's funny because whenever you see UFO stories from people who seem to be like salt of the earth people, you're like, I imagine my grandpa like seeing a UFO. If my grandpa saw a UFO, he'd never tell anybody. He'd be like, oh, that was weird. Because some people, like the people who go looking for this stuff, of course, they're going to tell everyone they know. They're going to be in line at the grocery store and they'll be like, guess what? I saw a UFO fly by and people are like, pa- you know, plastic or paper. Like they don't, they'll tell everybody. But whenever you meet someone who's basically just like a farmer, out the, a middle-aged or over-the-hill farmer out in the middle of nowhere who experiences some sort of paranormal phenomenon, it does add a little weight to it. You may think that's a little ageist. But I, you know, I actually know it's not because I'd say the same thing. If there was like a 20 year old guy working at the oil drill factory and that's all he did, he was just like a salt of the earth guy or he was a, a rodeo dude. Like there are just some people that seem more serious. I've talked to a lot of hunters up here. Whenever I meet someone who's hunting, we'll talk a bit and I will ask them, have you ever seen a Bigfoot? And a lot of times they'll be like, nah, nah, I don't believe in it. But every so often, I'll be talking to some dude, young or old, and I'll be like, have you ever seen Bigfoot? And they're like, "Eh, maybe. And they'll tell me a story. It's so, you know, because again, they're people who are out in the woods all the time. They're not like out there with their camcorders and their night vision goggles. They're just out there trying to hunt deer. And one day they'll be like, yeah. I've actually heard quite a few stories where they're like, I didn't see one, but I smelt one. I have grew up in the woods. I used to hunt. I've been hunting since I was six with my dad. I go there every season, deer season. And one day I 
came across something and I didn't get a glimpse of it, but I heard it and I smelled it and I knew immediately to get out of the area. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't a dead animal. It was something big and smelly. And it basically instilled them with fear and they left. I've heard that story a couple times. I haven't seen it, but I've smelled it. And Bigfoots generally do have a very pungent smell. Do you know Britney Spears has, like, she makes most of her money from perfume sales now. I think she makes, like, $60 million a year from perfume. Just a little side note. She's retired. That's kind of sad. Her dad's sick, so she's like, I'm done. I'm done performing. Anyway, okay, so let me get back to the Bigfoot story. Because I'm wandering off on my Britney Spears. So, <laughs> we're going all the way back to this. So, it's winter 1974. It's Polk County, Wisconsin. William Bosack driving down the road late at night. Driving home, not just driving down the road because, you know, it's fun. He's driving home. Thick fog bank rolls in. William looks around. He's like, I didn't know fog made noise, but apparently it does. Starts driving through the fog. Now, again, he's like, oh, whatever. It's fog. I live in the middle of nowhere. Whatever. I would be creeped out. I hate fog. I, uh, less than I hate snow, but I don't like fog. But anyways, he's just driving through it because it's no big deal. He lives out in the middle of nowhere. But through the fog, he sees a cone. Not a traffic cone, but a cone-shaped metal object hovering above the road. Now, it's through the fog. So, of course, your brain is going to be like, I'm not seeing that right. That's impossible. Why was there a metal cone? And at first, he thought it was like... A structure. He stops and he thinks it's like a metal structure that he's seeing wrong. But then he notices that there's nothing holding it up. It's basically hovering. It's a UFO very, very close to the ground. He described it. It was 10 feet by 3 feet. So quite small. It's about the size of my bedroom. But I was not there. And neither was my bedroom as far as I know. And it's hovering there. Now, this UFO, again, quite small. And this UFO has a unique shape to it. A unique feature, I should say. There's a curved window on the front. We presume it's the front. There's a curved window on the hovering cone. And William can see inside of it. We have his quote. I can remember it just as if it were yesterday. It was a little taller than a tall man. I could see a figure with its arms raised above its head. He was looking out the window, and it was a kind of different character than you'd see on this earth. It looked a good deal like a man, but it had a different-looking face than you'd see. It, it, it had a kind of cow-looking face. Dark tan fur, except for its face and chin, it... It had a square face with hair sticking straight out from the sides. The ears stuck out from the head about three inches, and the eyes were large and protruding. The ears were calf-like. So, he's looking at this thing, and his first thing that pops in his head, other than there's a calf-looking dude, a cow-looking dude looking at me, was first, because again, whenever you look at something weird, something that doesn't fit into the reality... Your brain will try to make sense of it. And his first thing, he sees the cone, hovering cone, that's weird. He sees the curved glass and the creature inside. His first sense is, that's not fur, he's wearing a suit. His brain tried making sense, because he's like, there's nobody that has fur. So his brain tried making sense of any part of it, and he goes, oh, that guy just must be wearing a suit. (laughs) Even though he's in a floating cone with a flattened cow face. He says that whatever was in there looked frightened, looked scared. And that scared William even more. He hits the gas, drives away from the thing. And at that point, he he says that he felt like dark, as he's leaving the area, he says he felt like darkness was starting to envelop the car. Like he just felt this surrounding darkness. The car seemed to not want to drive anymore. And then he hears scraping on the top of his vehicle, like branches as you're driving underneath a low-hanging tree. And at that point, he completely panics, floors it even more, if that's possible, but he does get away. He drives home, and from his house, he was close enough to his house, from his house, he could see the fog bank. 
he could see where the cone was, or should be, but the fog obscured it. Absolutely terrified. Doesn't tell his wife and his son. Can't sleep. The next day, he goes out to where the cone was hovering. and Because it was kind of to the side of the road. There was just flattened grass in that area. Now, he doesn't mention it to his wife and son. I think about two or three weeks pass. It may have even been longer before he mentions it to his wife and son. And at one point, I think he... Uh, goes to a friend who works for the newspaper or something like that. Like, there was a period of time. He either went to the newspaper or he went to the military first. It was one of the two, but eventually, like, he ended up getting interviewed about the story and things like that. Now, obviously, that makes you think it could be made up. He just may wanted some publicity or some fame or stuff like that. But again, in 1974, you're just a big old crackpot. This is before Project Blue Book, you know, broke open. This is back in that time where if you believed in UFOs at all, people go, what, little green men? So to come for nowadays people would go on the news and say, I'm pregnant with a ghost baby. Like, people are looking for that fame. But back then, it, 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 you were really ridiculed. If you, you were ridiculed now, but you were ridiculed even more back then. There's some interesting things about this story. One, when you read, when you read his description, when I think of that story... And he said, you know, the creature had its hands in the air. There's some drawings. And he says, you know, the drawings, like the crime scene, not crime scene drawings, but, you know, they'll have, like, the forensic artists come out. He goes, it's actually pretty close to what I saw. He goes, the ears could be a little bit different, but basically look like a cow without, like, the snout. A big furry body. So there have been comparisons to Bigfoot that maybe it was a Bigfoot in the ship. Bigfoot's and UFOs have been linked a lot. It's a, it's a theory called high strangeness. There are certain areas where it's just a pa- part was Partheon or Pantheon. It's a pantheon of weirdness. You'll get Bigfoot sightings and UFO sightings and disappearances and all this stuff in a unique area. It's called high strangeness. Nothing weird, paranormal kind of exists in a vacuum. So the idea is it's possibly Bigfoot uh, piloting the ship. That Bigfoot is an alien. That was one of the theories that came out. I think the it, it seems Bigfoot-esque because it's so tall and it has the hair. The ears and it looking like a cow don't really jive with descriptions of Bigfoot. So I don't really buy the Bigfoot theory. It could be a creature that is also just very tall and very hairy. It could be an ugly Bigfoot. It could be the Bigfoot that is ostracized from Bigfoot communities because he has those ears and those features. It could have just been, well, obviously it could have just been his imagination too. The fact that this guy sees a cow-looking shape and he lives out where a bunch of cows are. I mean, it could have just been his imagination. could have been a late night. But it could have been an alien similar to a Bigfoot. But whether or not it's Bigfoot or just a furry cow alien or made up or anything like that, I think a more interesting question is this. He said afterwards, he had this quote. He believes, like, later on in his life, he said... I should have stopped and tried to show it I was friendly. I wish I could meet up with it again. So he has this idea that he startled it as much as it startled him. And he took off and it freaked that creature out as well. And it's almost like this regret, like he should have got out and made first contact with this thing. I don't think it was the pilot of that ship. This is just from reading a couple articles about this thing. And I wasn't there, obviously. William Bosack knows more about this than I do, but... The fact that it had its arms up almost is in a submissive pose. Like, the arms weren't like, it wasn't like punching his fist. Like, his arms were up that if I drew handcuffs on it, it would look perfect. The fact that the ship was so small, 10 feet by 3 feet. I mean, like I said, that's the size of an apartment. Bedroom. But that's probably the size of my tiny kitchen, honestly. 10 feet by 3 feet is like a cell. And it had its arms up kind of over its head. Again, not like in an aggressive posture. You can look at the picture, but it's basically like 50 shades of grays. Like it's a UFO submissive posture. They just put on some laser handcuffs. You could see an alien walking in there with a whip. I don't think it was the pilot. I think it was a prisoner. Is it possible that it was some sort of Bigfoot creature or some sort of cryptid that wasn't the pilot of this ship in the middle of nowhere, but it's captive. And the reason why it was scared wasn't because it was seeing a human. It may have been a Bigfoot creature 
that is used to seeing humans, that knows it exists on the same planet as humans, but it was as terrified to see the UFO as William Bosack was. If you have a creature that's taller than a tall man, so let's say 7, 8 feet tall, and the ship is only 10 feet tall, that's a tiny ship. Was he a prisoner? Are aliens also abducting Bigfoots and other cryptids from our planet? And, more chilling, if that ship was there, and it hadn't abducted the creature that it did, would William Bozak instead, would it have been him to forever disappear into that fog bank? deadrabbitradio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys.